Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Glenn Guerra, the Director of Evolutionary Studies. I am happy to be introducing the third speaker in our series, um, David Rothenberg. A couple of quick housekeeping notes first. Um, if you haven't yet joined the best club on campus, which is the Evos Club, there's going to be a general interest meeting um, led by Brianna, president of the club, if you could do a little. And it's going to be awesome, just the meeting itself, as well as the rest of it. So please join. That's going to be Wednesday coming up at 6. Um, and the, uh, there will be a reception, as we typically have. There's going to be pizza and Evo's cake. If you haven't had Evo's cake yet, you are missing out. And that's going to be in CSB 110 immediately after, um, sponsored by the Evo's Club. So please join us for that. Um, very, very interesting guest today, David Rothenberg. In EVOS, we like to talk about the importance of integration of different academic fields, and this is a guy who does that as much as anyone. He is a philosophy professor at NJIT. He's also a professor of music. Um, he's a naturalist. He has published several books. He has played music with lots of animals from various species and various phyla. Um, his book, Thousand Mile Song, which is about um, the music made by the humpback whale, is that right, the humpback whale? Yes. Is going to be made into a feature documentary film called Whale Stock. It's true. Isn't that awesome? That is <laughs> awesome. He, um, he has been, he has had a feature length TV documentary on the BBC all about his work on bird songs. Um, he has used evolution to help us understand the nature of nature itself. Please join me in welcoming David Rothenberg. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Glenn. Thanks for inviting me. You're very lucky to have such a cool series at your school. I've never seen anything like it anywhere. All these speakers, evolution from so many points of view. Well, I've just been talking to some students in the next room for the last hour. And most of my talk is going to be about visual art and nature and why nature evolves such cool, beautiful stuff that sometimes seems really quite frivolous and useless. But my whole interest in this really began with music. So we're going to begin and end with a little bit of music here, even though I'm not playing anything today, unfortunately. But uh, I'm going to show you this little uh, video clip of the very moment I first got interested in uh, that music might teach us something about nature. When I went to uh, visit the National Aviary in Pittsburgh around 6 in the morning one day playing my clarinet, and I was very surprised to see this one bird that really kind of seemed to respond to what I was doing. It was not what I expected. got interested in this whole thing, you know, because what does this mean, I thought at the moment, what, what does this actually mean if this one bird was somehow interested in what I was doing, that music could really communicate with, with a singing bird, and it, 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 um, 
Later I learned why the white-crested laughing thrush is one of the best birds to play music along with because uh, this bird uses song in a way very different than most birds in that in most cases bird song males have evolved the need to sing a solo performance to defend their territories and attract mates. But white crested laughing thrushes don't do that. The males and females sing together and they, um, they kind of sing elaborate duets back and forth using song in a whole different way than most bird species. And I was surprised to have just sort of happened upon that by just playing my clarinet in this aviary. And it started making me think that maybe music is one way that we could understand and communicate with the natural world and learn how much aesthetics and beauty is a part of the natural world. So this led me to write a book called Why Birds Sing, where I investigated all the things human beings have said about bird song, from poets to scientists to musicians over the centuries. And after that, I did this. And, and part of that book, the book begins and ends with me playing live along with birds and how it changes. So I've learned things along the path. The second book like that is called Thousand Mile Song, about playing music with whales, which is much harder to do because they're underwater. And so there I was playing my clarinet in a boat and broadcasting the sound under, <coughs> underwater and then listening and putting it all together. And uh, the third book in that series is coming out next month. It's about insects. It's called Bug Music. And it's about actually playing live with bugs and all kinds of weird things that, that you can do. And you probably all know that this year millions of 17-year cicadas will descend upon the Hudson Valley just around the time of your graduation, all you're going to hear is all these sounds. And that's the time when you can really engage with the insect world. And I think all of these sonic phenomena have a lot to do with aesthetics, something that's often left out. And today I'm not going to talk so much about music, but more about the larger issue behind this whole story, which I wrote about in my last book, Survival of the Beautiful, where I really wanted to examine how much aesthetics really has a role in evolution, much more than is usually heard about in science. And this book begins with something that Charles Darwin said. He said, you know, the peacock's tail, you know, that's something that really makes me sick. And he wrote that in a letter to Asa Gray because he couldn't really explain the existence of something like this with natural selection. It just didn't seem like something this flamboyant could be a good example of survival of the fittest, of natural selection. If you're really going to evolve useful, practical traits, you wouldn't have a bird that looks like this. And so that sent him on the whole journey into understanding sexual selection, the evolution of often very extreme traits in the animal world just because, in most cases, just because, you know, just because one sex develops a trait, just because the other sex likes it. Often it's the males that develop these flamboyant things, but not always. And in the case of the peacock, you know, the only reason this could possibly have evolved, Darwin surmises, is because the females just turned out they liked something this extreme. That's how it happened. And that's where all the trouble starts. And you have things like the birds of paradise, you know, the, the blue bird of paradise, the red bird of paradise. These things are so flamboyant and strange and, and marvelous that when they were brought back to Europe from New Guinea, you know, everyone said, surely wherever you, you must have been to paradise, finding creatures like this, and nowhere on earth could, could have these extreme kinds of creatures. How useful could this strange feather be? You know, it must always get tangled in, in anything. And um, then when I was studying bird songs in Australia, I came across this pile of blue plastic garbage in the wilderness. Blue bottle caps and straws. And it was like in the middle of some rainforest. And I, I thought, like, who dropped all this blue stuff here? And then my guide, Sid Curtis, said, that's a sculpture made by a bird. That's the artwork of a bowerbird, a satin bowerbird. I said, what, you know, the bird collects blue plastic things and brings them back here? You know, this is a place there were no people anywhere near. He goes, well, you know, t traditionally they used blue flower petals, but it's much easier to find blue plastic garbage now. And so uh, there you have it. And this is, a, you know, it, and then when I came back to working on this book to 
discuss the aesthetics of, of uh, nature in a general sense, that um, I came back to the example of bowerbirds because this is a s group of bird species that has evolved the need to make these things. And they're often described as being nests. And they're not nests. Why aren't they nests? Well, they don't lay eggs there and sit there and, and nest in them. These are artworks designed to attract the females to come. And maybe the female will be impressed enough to want to mate. Most of the time, they're not at all impressed. They just go away. But it, it's, it's kind of telling that when this is often described in the press, the human press, is always saying they're nests because they want to believe that birds are building nests, very practical things. They don't like the idea that birds are making sculptures. Why do I call this a sculpture? Because it doesn't have a practical purpose. You know, it's called a bower. It's a bower because it looks like a garden design of a bower when the Victorian naturalists first named these things. There is the satin bower bird himself in front of his bower. She decorates with whatever he can find that's blue. And here, the, the, in, the, in this um, species of bower bird, you have the structure that, that you could see is like a kind of theater box seat. That the female comes there right inside the bower and watches. Then the male starts this elaborate display of tossing uh, different decorations up in the air, squawking and dancing around, a whole performance. And then she decides whether she likes it afterwards. Maybe once in a while mating might happen. And, and traditionally, the uh, literature on bowerbirds by ornithologists and biologists would say that the louder the performance, the longer, the, the higher he tosses the flowers, the more blue stuff, more, 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 the more the excessive, then the, the more mating success. And that's what was said for many years until um, mostly by men were saying that this most, but uh, there was one woman studying in this laboratory, Gail Patricelli, and she, she was observing the bird. And she says, I don't think it works that way. I think that the performance shouldn't be too loud, too much, that when it gets too excessive, the females fly away. They don't like it when it's too, too much. And, and they said, well, how are you going to study that? It goes, simple, I'm going to build a fembot bowerbird. The female bowerbird here, controlled by this box, and she would make it flinch when the performance got too, too excessive. And she found by manipulating this robot, she could in very carefully control the performance of the male and thereby come up with this idea that it's not the most, it's not the biggest, it's not the loudest, but the best. Somehow a balanced something in there that's much harder to study and much less discussed in the aesthetics of animals. That maybe there, it's not just the most and the biggest. Maybe things are more complicated. Why should we make the aesthetics of animal species so simple? And why do I say this is aesthetics? Well, look at this other species. This is a Vogelkopf's bowerbird. He could use all manner of things, you know, caterpillar shit, piles of caterpillar shit, berries, orange blossoms, you know, the larva case of insects. And, and he builds this giant thing. It's like a teepee. Decorates it in this whole very strange manner. And this is the bower built by the Vogelkopf's bowerbird. And you think, like, what, what could possess evolution to lead over millions of years to produce something as strange as this? And if you came upon this in the forest of New Guinea, would you imagine a bird could have made such a thing or would, would, would want to? Very strange. There's another one from the Solomon Islands. Different decorations, but the same species. I don't know, do you think this one's better? This one better? Which one is going to have more success? We don't know. No one has quite studied the sense of what the best Vogelkopf's bower is. Here's different species and the different things that they're doing. So each species makes a very different kind of structure. Some of them are like Christmas trees. Some of them are like, uh, you know, big uh, giant skyscrapers with a bridge going across. Some of them are these avenue kind of bowers. And each species has this distinctive kind of design, distinctive decoration. And here's an evolutionary tree suggesting how the species are related. But you look at this tree, you said, well, is there a reason for these different things to have evolved? Are they, are they, more, are they practical in, in any particular sense? No, we don't really know. And the question is, should we find a reason that the satin bowerbird is decorating his with blue and the spotted bowerbird is decorating his with white? Are we going to find a reason why there's white in one species and blue in another? Or is it something arbitrary that has evolved through sexual selection that the females just seemed to prefer males who had the ability 
to make these, these sculptures, these artworks. Now, this isn't a bower at all. This is a sculpture made by Patrick Doherty, an American sculptor, who builds these bowerbird-like things and puts them on parks all over the, the world, open spaces. And I asked him, like, I mean, what do you know about bowerbirds? He goes, oh, yeah, I've been aware of them for a long time. And, but what interests me is what happens when we look at something made by a bird like this. And, you know, if you've... If you are familiar with contemporary art, do you see something like this? Does it look more like an artwork to us than it might have 100 years ago when there weren't so many artworks that were strange assemblages of different things? I can imagine this in an art gallery, strange structure and piles set up in an installation. And when we have artists making things like this, do we then see the work of bowerbirds as much more like art than the original discoverers who called them bowers or called them... Wanted, to, wanted them desperately to be nests, be something practical. And one of the things that interested me is how the evolution of what humans appreciate as art might change what we find as being beautiful in nature. We still have the peacock's tail, though, that, that remains kind of excessive. And, and the, the most famous example of excess in evolution and something that's very hard to see as being particularly useful if you were going to believe that evolution was the survival of useful and fit traits. This is clearly about something else. And I got interested in this for, for you know, th this is an excessive example of plumage, something really totally off the deep end in terms of being too much. And uh, you can, the same thing can be said about uh, certain sounds in the animal world. The song of a nightingale is very long. They'll go on for hours and hours at night, many different sections. We're going to hear this at the end of my presentation. You know, you, you can, and this is a sonogram, a printout of um, frequency against time. And you can learn to read this like music, so I can sing it for you. Boo, 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 you know, so you can, and, and, and this is like, um, that's one phrase. They have up to 150 phrases like this, and they're all put together in some kind of order. And uh, what fascinated me is how that song was actually similar to the structure of a humpback whale song, which, is, although it's much lower in frequency, it takes longer to sing. You know, whales are not just going, Ooh. they have a whole structured song, like they'll be going, and go on and on. It'll take them up to half an hour to sing this whole thing. And it has different phrases, it has different rhythms, different, different way of being put together. But something about the level of complexity and structure and difference between um, similar elements and the different ones, it's very similar to a nightingale. And yet these animals are very far away from each other on the, on the branches of evolution. Why are they, and they're both very unusual among their fellow species in, in having this very excessive kind of display, like the musical version of what the peacock has. Why are these things at all similar? Does it suggest there might be certain senses of pattern and form at the very root of evolution? I'm not the only one to have noticed this. I saw this artwork in London last year on the wall that someone had done an example of, you know, nightingale and whale, bird and whale together. Maybe there's some imaginary species that combines these things. But the fact is there isn't, and yet the song is what's similar between them. But another way of looking at uh, nature perhaps being beautiful is looking at the vast assortment of uh, symmetry and color and pattern at, at various levels of the natural world. And this is an aspect of the diversity of life that uh, although Darwin talked about a lot, he wasn't so involved in illustrating it. And one of his most famous disciples was the German biologist Ernst Haeckel, who as a, as a 20-year-old student wrote to Darwin, sent him some of his um, drawings and paintings and said, I'm your biggest fan. I'm going to make your name famous all across Europe by showing visually what is so beautiful about the diversity of nature. And he proceeded to do that and spent a lot of time drawing and painting the, the diversity of microscopic sea creatures. Like this is not a geodesic dome by Buckminster Fuller. It's a, it's a, it's a tiny uh, sea creature called a radiolarian that uh, Heckel got delivered to him from an, a sea expedition in the Arctic. He got these microscopic creatures. He looked on the microscope and then he drew and painted them to reveal all their beauty and symmetry and produced pages and pages of these tracts sometimes in scientific books trying to catalog exactly what the features were of all these creatures. Sometimes in art books, he 
wrote a book called Art Forms in Nature. That was one of the early popular coffee table books. It's always been in print since the 1880s, just sort of showing how nature is really beautiful. This is a page from it. And these are also microscopic sea creatures. And these patterns became the basis for all kinds of aesthetic movements in architecture and decorative art and were, were uh, known all over the world. He, was vi he felt he was visually revealing the vast beauty and diversity that Darwin had explained, some of the mechanisms, how it got to be. Here you see an illustration showing on the left a page from one of his scientific catalogs of, of uh, sea creatures, and on the right from art forms in nature. You know, on the left, these are you know, a bunch of different uh, specific creatures exactly listed. And on the right, you have this kind of ornate decorative illustration of seaweed. And uh, it's sort of arranged to show how beautiful it is. And yet it's uh, just a short distance away from what he would call the scientific illustration. Here's some more, uh, you know, radiolaria. And the, the, these, these illustrations were seen as like the radical progressive artworks of their scientific age. Just like today you see, um, I don't know what you can compare them to, maybe scans of the brain blown up into artworks or... or um, or kind of the, the connection between scientific illustration and beauty. And uh, they specifically were the models for, art, you know, kind of decorative architecture of the time, like this gate by René Binet for the Paris Exposition of 1907 was specifically put forth as an example of, uh, you know, the, the future of art, nature, and science coming together. Like the ideas of Ernst Haeckel turned into a building. It was a temporary building, so it's not there anymore. You see the Eiffel Tower in the back. That's still there. And uh, as he created more and more of these illustrations, Heckel um, uh, got more and more abstract and wild looking. And this is like, you know, what is it? It's not, it's not really a, an organism anymore. You know, he's moved beyond from this, uh, these seaweed things to this kind of meditation upon tentacles. And, and this was the beginning of the 20th century. And this, this, these works influenced a whole many generations of artists. And uh, Max Ernst liked the gooey side of Heckel, <coughs> kind of a surrealist creation here. And uh, you know, he specifically said that Heckel's more symmetrical kinds of half nature scientific ideas were influencing his more abstract forms here. Can't tell what they are. This is Victor Horta. He was an interior designer. It's a famous uh, building in, in Belgium where, where he was turning these, these heckle ideas into, <coughs> excuse me, into um, kind of decorative designs in the, and the whole generation of Art Deco buildings and chandeliers and furniture was inspired by, by Heckel's sense of art coming from nature. Giacomo Bala did this um, kind of vision of the sun and moon building on these ideas of symmetry, things from nature. You can trace this to contemporary 3D printer, you know, printouts of, of uh, fractal mathematics into the same sense of the beauty that's there and the symmetry of nature. This kind of beauty that Heckel uh, said came from an inspiration from Darwin's ideas, but on the other hand, this kind of beauty doesn't really come from sexual selection necessarily, but the senses of form and order and organization that maybe all of nature just has because of how mathematics, physics, and chemistry work. So what does that say about this problematic peacock's tail? Is that, you know, you'd think that Darwin would suggest that um, selective forces are kind of arbitrary. A mutation begins. Anything could be selected for. Anything goes. Anything could happen. Maybe not anything, maybe just anything chosen from a series of possibilities of um, you know, what senses of symmetry and form are actually out there, what can happen. And you know, the kind of things that Heck will be interested in are seen in all levels of nature, from cellular things, microscopic, different levels you see. You see repeating forms, shapes. It doesn't really matter what these things are, except that they're, you know, certain senses of circle and pattern and, and order that's never exact, kind of irregular but regular. All these things people point out as being somehow natural. And uh, are the possibilities of what kind of feathers could form 
could it really be anything, or are they chosen from various possibilities that nature offers? <coughs> Excuse me. Here we get to the professor of e ecology and ornithology at Yale, Richard Prum, who uh, is a major character in my book because he's one of very few evolutionary thinkers today who think aesthetics is really important to his scientific work. And he is... Um, in the course of, as I was researching the book, he himself was getting much more interested in these topics and really trying to, really finding that the history of aesthetics and philosophy was helping him in his, in his scientific endeavors. And he, um, he developed, uh, building on some works of, of Alan Turing, one of the pioneers of computer science and uh, famous for the Turing test, which enables us to say whether a computer could be intelligent or not was also worked on activation inhibition mathematics that <coughs> explains how pigments work, you know, what, why leopards and tigers have certain kinds of spots and stripes. He worked on that also in the 1950s. And Prum, together with a mathematician, worked on expanding these ideas to demonstrate what, what turned out to be just nine basic possible feather shapes. Feather patterns. These are all the kinds of feather patterns that exist are a version of this. And then they were able to, because of advances in genetics, advances in genetics is really what has brought sexual selection back into the discussion among biologists today and making it much more a subject of study to figure out how, what genetic information leads these feather types to appear. And on the basis of that, they became the first group of scientists to accurately figure out what colors and patterns a dinosaur had. This is a feathered dinosaur, Anchiornix, found in China. And, and because of advances in genetics and this kind of aesthetic approach that Prum thought was important, this is the first accurate depiction of what color a dinosaur looks like, even though we've seen um, hundreds of colored dinosaurs that basically been all made up until this. And so this got a lot of attention, this discovery. And here's the Ralph Steadman version, which is kind of just expresses the, the, the greatness of this crazy discovery. And, um, but then it's worth noting that Richard Prum really is the one biologist who decided that, you know, science can learn a lot by, by paying attention to Marcel Duchamp and this famous artwork called Fountain, which was, was uh, put out exactly 100 years ago in the Armory Show in New York when uh, the organizers of the show said, any works will be accepted into our show. Can you imagine if an art curator said that today? What they would do, we'll accept anything. And so Deschamps said, oh, yeah, I'm going to just pull this urinal out of the bathroom and bring it there. Let's see what they say to that. And so um, lots of people were angry. And he signed it, R. Mutt, which is nice. And uh, Lots of people were very angry by this, but uh, over the years, it had been often discussed as a very turn, a great turning point in, in the history of modern art. And Prum got really interested in this when he read the article by the philosopher Arthur Danto called The Art World that talks about this artwork and Andy Warhol's Brillo boxes. And this is a philosopher and art critic. He was writing that in the 1960s. By then, these works were discussed quite a lot. And, uh, and he said, well, why are they important when a lot of people don't even think they are art? What's important about them? And he decided that what was important about them is that there is such a discussion about them going on, that the work is only important because there's a whole lot of people discussing their importance. And then Prum, as a biologist, said, aha, that's how nature works. That's how sexual selection works. It's only art. It's only beautiful. The peacock's tail is only beautiful because the female peahens have evolved the need to prefer it. There's no art in nature without the evolution of aesthetic preference. And so biology has a lot to learn from the philosophy of art to begin to take this seriously, because it seemed like, you know, even today, biology is not taking the aesthetics of, of peacock's tails and bower bird creations and bird and whale songs very seriously. They're trying to say something that Richard Prum really didn't like. They're trying to say that all of this is useful. It's all an indication of fitness. That uh, the peacock is showing that 
He's got this giant tail. He can lug it around. He's strong enough to carry this useless thing around. This means you should mate with him because he can, he, he can handle this huge handicap, this extra thing. And, and Prum didn't like the fact that this idea was gaining currency in biology when, in fact, uh, it's avoiding the very aesthetic nature of this phenomenon. It's no accident that a peacock's tail says beauty to us, beauty, excess, t- tremendous you know, symmetry and, 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 and ornament and all these things that get an aesthetic reaction in humans are also what's going on in the birds. And that's what needs, what needs to be studied, the evolution of um, aesthetics as part of biology. And so in recent papers he's published, he's tried to get people that take this seriously and says that there has to be much more research of the aesthetic kind in trying to understand sexual selection. Like, what's the best nightingale song? Do we have any idea? Too much of writing in, in, in a bird song science says, oh, it's the longest, it's the loudest, and the one with the most complexity. And yet the study that uh, Gail Patricelli did on, on bowerbirds said, why are we going for the most, the biggest? Just because it's easiest to measure. But, you know, she demonstrated with bowerbirds it's much more nuanced and complicated than that. And every species that has this kind of sexual selection has its own aesthetic sense that's evolved. And if we take this more seriously, we will better understand how nature is working. By, by instead of denying aesthetics in nature, by recognizing it's there and trying to figure it out. So... This is one of Richard Prum's experiments, which somehow is very Duchampian to me. The, the ornate, strange mating apparatus of ducks. The duck penis and vagina, very strange creations. I think Duchamp would have liked this. This is outside Prum's office next to the picture of the, the fountain artwork. So you can go to Yale and see it, the Peabody Museum. So, but you know, sexual selection, peacock's tails, flamboyance, females having all the deciding power. Darwin said all these things in The Descent of Man. They were very unpopular in the 19th century. What do you think this is a painting of? What is it? Yeah, it's called Peacock in the Woods by Albert Thayer. And this painting is in the Smithsonian Museum of American Art in Washington. And he painted this as part of a book that he wrote together with his son trying to argue that, you know, this sexual selection idea is completely ridiculous. Everything in nature that evolves is for a purpose. Every coloration of every animal is for camouflage. So the peacock's tail is to actually hide the peacock in the forest. So this is a didactic painting making an argument. Painting as scientific argument. Peacock hiding in the woods. And his book, which you can download for free, Google Books, is called Concealing Coloration in the Animal Kingdom. Everyone should read it. It's really fun. Flamingos are pink because they're disguised at sunset and sunrise. This one I find more convincing, the wood duck, the most beautiful um, kind of flamboyantly colored duck you might see around here, is actually all a matter of disguise. You can't see him against the pond in light. And this is a you know, kind of convincing painting, and it's true. Wood ducks are both beautiful and hard to see at the same time. They're both flamboyant and disguised, which suggests an aspect of this story that maybe is more complicated. In general, biology doesn't promote this idea that every animal, and even in the time, in 1909 or so, they were not impressed that um, every animal coloration was a form of camouflage. However, people that were impressed was the Navy, and the entire use of camouflage in the military actually begins with this book. The book was taken very seriously by the military, and believe it or not, they painted ships in World War I to look like this. So they'd be harder to see. This is called Dazzle Camouflage. The USS Leviathan, you know, and you think about it, on the one hand, it's totally ridiculous, but just like the wood duck, you can't quite tell where the duck ends and the background begins. Sorry, I'm losing my voice as I get more excited about this. But you can see that with this ship, you can't tell how big it is. Like, is this some sort of little monster here? You know, like a crocodile? Where's the, where, where's the ship going? What direction? This was, was uh, very effective at... at uh, well, we, well, there's debate as to how effective it was at confusing the enemy. It was definitely effective at exciting the troops to really... They liked having ships like this. And uh, it was used a little bit in World War II, not as much, but it was... Um, 
based on the idea that you know a lot of the coloration of all kinds of creatures really is it's not just flamboyance it's um, is useful and shows natural selection at work how does it connect to sexual selection are, are they is sexual selection really part of adaptation or is it a conflicting force that works against it here you have you know fish and frogs it's called disruptive coloration that confuses you you can't tell the boundaries of the animal you can't tell what you're looking at these are some of the principles of camouflage border coloration that were introduced by um, you know, those who studied this in this period, the beginning of the 20th century. But no animal is better at this than the cuttlefish. It's kind of squid. And they give an example of, again, the kind of extremes in, um, in nature, in life, that kind of confuse these theories and makes us wonder if maybe we're kind of all on the wrong track. This is a, a small squid. And they study them in Woods Hole. You can go there and study cuttlefish. You can take this cuttlefish, put it on different backgrounds, and it changes its coloration to blend in. And it doesn't do it automatically. It can decide whether to do it or not. You could call this cuttlefish abuse here, putting one on a checkerboard, seeing how well it can do. And uh, you know, grades of disruptive coloration were come up with. And they, um, here's a, a different species, a bigger one, sort of in disguise on them. Um, you know, in Australia. But what's really remarkable about these guys is if they want to turn their camouflage on, they can. If they want to turn it off, they also can. Sometimes they put on bright pulsing displays, like a whole light show. They really look like uh, animated science fiction creatures. And you can see many films of this happening online. And, and sometimes they can put one half of their body in disguise, make the other half put on a weird display. They're colorblind. They can't see any colors. So and until a few months ago, it wasn't known how they could possibly respond to the colors. But then it was, it was uh, recently a paper published saying that the, 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 the color-sensitive cells on their bodies called chromatophores, they are able to directly respond to colors. Like that's where, through the cells all over their body, they can kind of see in a way that their eyes are not doing. And no, nobody knew about that before. So the cuttlefish sort of... Uh, puts this real sense of confusion in this issue between coloration as display, showing off, excess, and adaptively fitting in. And so, um, you know, the people who worked on camouflage in uh, World War I, many of them were artists, put artists to work in the military. One was Thomas Hart Benton. It's one of his paintings. He, uh, I, you know, this part of the book goes into a whole discussion of how this study of camouflage, which began as an attempt to explain something about nature, becomes, becomes a principle that leads to abstract art. Thomas Hart Benton made paintings like this, but then he be, he's famously began to teach classes in how to become an abstract painter, even though he himself wasn't one. So here in this illustration from a magazine article, he shows how you can take a real landscape, abstract from it, and get patterns and motion. One of his students was Jackson Pollock, who then made art even more abstract, but was very interested in camouflage and is famous for disguising his name and other things inside of paintings like this. His name's supposed to be in this painting. It takes a lot of bending to actually see it, but I think, you know, maybe it's there. But that's how... So, so the idea that abstraction can come out of uh, paying attention to the colorations in nature, that the, you can trace this evolution of artistic thinking through camouflage all the way to abstract art. And now you have the sense of, I'm, of um, I should have stuck one more Pollock in there to show the complete craziness of color that has become famous. And, uh, but instead, I have a few pictures of photographs that artists had taken, sort of random artists who happened to post them online and say, isn't this like a Jackson Pollock? And I put this here because we have people who are looking at landscapes and thinking they are artistically interesting because they have... Um, kind of internalize the sense of very abstract art as being relevant. This photograph of lichen was put forth as, a, isn't it like a Pollock painting? And what interests me here about this, and I think what should interest scientists, is because we've had a direction in art that takes some um, abstract colors and shapes seriously as aesthetic experiences, we can see new senses of order and pattern and imagine something like this as being beautiful and, and interesting where in perhaps previous centuries we might not have appreciated it as much. Another photograph, the photographer pointed up and saying, this reminds me of a Pollock painting. So um, 
back in the 1950s, or even 40s actually, Ad Reinhardt put together this, uh, this uh, evolutionary tree of modern art in America, suggesting that the way artists were thinking about art kind of evolved from the way scientists had thought about evolution, that arts and st different artists and styles evolved from earlier ones and spread out in many different directions, not going any one place in particular, but kind of spreading out into diversity. And, you know, evolution is expanded to influence the way we think about a lot of things. Here, on the other hand, is a diagram about relationships between scientific paradigms by Brad Paley, it's a famous uh, data visualizer. This is exactly the opposite of a tree, a strange linking of fields and subfields that's almost impossible to read, even if you blow it up. He's just showing that science is a confused, interconnecting thread of things. And maybe... Meanwhile, artists are trying to think their way of thinking is more like an evolutionary tree. And science, as the way it's all put together, is more like a Pollock painting. So that got me thinking in, in um, okay, I can see how um, science has influenced art in so many different ways. I wondered how art had really influenced science. And I asked a lot of scientists, like, hey, has art really influenced you? Like has, you know, do art, does art really help science? And one of the most interesting commentators on this is Roald Hoffman, is a, a man who won the Nobel Prize in chemistry. He's a professor at Cornell. And he's also a poet. He's published a lot of poetry books, and he does a lot of uh, art science events. I asked him, do you have any good examples? At first he said, well, no, not really, because science and art work so differently. But he did think of, he suggested the example of Kenneth Snelson, who's an artist who studied at Black Mountain College and made sculptures like this, which ended up influencing his teacher, Buckminster Fuller, who said, oh, this is like, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, Snelson came up with the word tensegrity to show how, how wires could hold up rigid things like logs and pieces of sticks like this. And, and Buckminster Fuller developed this into a practical architectural technique which then became used by his students like Norman Foster, building buildings like this all over the world, using a technique that an artist developed. And so Hoffman said that was one example when artist influenced science, but on the other hand, it is sort of like an art influencing engineering. He also mentioned Jane Richardson, who was a chemist who also was drawing a lot. And, and chemists are often trying to figure out how proteins fold together. and They're actually very confusing and you can't always figure it out. You have to play around with the imagery of ways it could work. And she was just doodling and came up with the, the, the structure of, of um, a complex protein. This is a famous drawing that she made that enabled her to figure this out. And today this problem still goes on. It's still hard to figure out how proteins fold. But now it's become a computer game developed by Dr. David Baker called Fold It, fold.it. You can play online, help, help uh, protein scientists figure out how the proteins fold because they don't have the time to play around with this data so much. But they figured if you get thousands of people playing around all over the world playing this game, you, they're going to figure it out. And that's how people have been able to uh, help scientists fold proteins by, by playing this game. So if you think computer games are a form of art, then they're helping science. And now there are several, um, there are several uh, competing things like this as well. And one of them, you have the prize that if you figure out a protein, they'll synthesize it for you. That's your prize. The protein will be made. Here's an artwork by, uh, by Evelina Dominich and Dmitry Gelfand, two Russian-born artists, about sonoluminescence, in which they had heard of this phenomenon that, apply, that playing certain sounds to a solution of chemical in water might lead you know, the, the, the chemical structures to start to glow. And they said, well, that sounds so crazy. Does it really work? And the chemist said, oh, yeah, it's so faint. You can't really see it. They said, we want to be able to see it. We want to make it work. And they said, you, you can't. It doesn't really work. But they managed to spend years working with scientists to figure out how to really make this a visible phenomenon you can see. And they created this artwork that's in this big sphere, which you go into a darkened room, and the sound is, is broadcasting, and the whole thing seems to glow with these strange shapes. And, and this you know, really helped the scientists realize that, huh, there really is something to this phenomenon. It can be intensified, and they never thought it was possible. And, the, and it, it took some artists who really wanted to see it to, to really make it happen. I don't know why this is here exactly, except that I, I was impressed in an art magazine to see an ad for a dinosaur skeleton. 
just for sale, starting bids, you know, one million euros. And uh, right next to, to um, that, in a, you know, every other page was an ad for artworks and art exhibits, and that somebody was presenting a fossil as something that we might consider as art, or at least be as valuable as art to the kind of people who might be buying expensive art. Then, of course, is the famous works by people like Damien Hirst. There's just a big shark inside of formaldehyde. A lot of people don't like this artwork, but it exists, and it is taken seriously and is... Um, is part of the world of art, and as, as Arthur Danto taught us, taught us, these things are only important because people are arguing about them, wondering whether they're art at all, and buying and selling them, and valuing them. And nature works that way. Our interest in nature starting to work that way, and um, I think I will stop this presentation at this point, which began with uh, music. Oh, one more thing comes afterwards. It began with uh, you know, why I got interested in using music to approach nature, and then why I think there's animals evolved to make art, and uh, why art is starting to help us change the way we see order and pattern in nature, and so we'll, I think we'll increasingly end up helping scientists. And I, I talked about how um, the, uh, you know, that the humpback whale song and nightingale song are like each other, and, and you might not have believed me. So I thought I would play you these songs and other similar. And you'll look at a sonogram, which is a, is a visual representation used by science to make complex sounds comprehensible. So here we go. Beginning of a humpback whale song. Okay, now I'm speeding up the song so it starts to sound more like a bird song. But this is the whale song sped up. Okay, now a truck nightingale song comes in. Something similar about the level of variation and repetition in this song. And now the nightingale song is slowed down to the realm of the whale. And now you kind of hear them overlapping together. So you think about is there an unusual similarity here, or are they just totally different things? I feel like I hear they're related to one another, that there's a strange evolutionary convergence that's happened here towards these kinds of structures, these kinds of extreme and organized animal performances. I know it starts to look kind of confusing, but if you look at these things, you can start to read them and see kind of structure that can be difficult to hear. So I, I end with the animals speaking for themselves. I think we, we're only going to understand such phenomena when, when we recognize that they are about aesthetic sense and beauty from the perspective of these different creatures. And I think that we stop. We, we can figure it out. It, it we'll be able to, to progress in this area. So thank you. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> I'm happy to answer whatever questions I'm given time to answer now or in the uh, magic pizza and cake reception. Any questions? Is it known whether, um, whether peacocks can see the color, the, the same color that we see in their tail? Uh, people are starting to study that now. And uh, I th uh, birds see differently. They see they have a different color space than we do. They see more uh, kind of ultraviolet light. So there's a lot of this shimmering color that we don't see. But what, what kind of studies are be, being, being done now is what, 
how the, the female peacock, how does the pea hen look at this display? What's she actually paying attention to? Can we follow her eyes as she assesses it? This is Tim Hill, by the way. He's been performing with, uh, with, uh, sing, sing, with insects with me. He's on my insect record, which is called Bug Music, that just came out. I have some copies of it. Or you can wait till the book comes out and wait till the cicadas are around, because then you'll see the two of us traveling around this area performing live with very strange creatures. So, yes? Yeah, one, one image I specifically showed was, was a fractal, um, was a, you know, a fractal equation that the Mandelbrot set turned into this structure. I mean, fractal mathematics, as, as the, discovered by Mandelbrot, you know, he presented as a way to uh, explain the kind of ordered unevenness of nature. So how much of it it can explain is open to debate, but it's definitely a kind of mathematics that's trying to describe certain irregularity in nature that... Um, previously seemed messy. Although a lot of what I was showing was so symmetrical and uh, simpler that, uh, you know, maybe something as, as uh, complex as, as fractals isn't necessary to explain them. But you're right that fractal mathematics have been used to try and explain a lot of these things. Yeah? I uh, what was the first? Uh, I think I've heard of it, but I haven't read it. What? Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, you could look at what I'm, the examples I've given and say they are freaks of nature too. Like, peacock is just a freak. It's absurd. It makes me sick. Made Darwin sick, at least. Or, you know, that, that, that whales that sing for 24 hours at a time. This is ridiculous. This is a freakish behavior. You should be as quiet and sleek and, you know, not bothering anybody. You know, that, that uh, you could say these are all very freakish examples. But I, I'm intrigued by that idea that, that, that the real freaks are the important ones. But does he find a lot of two headed creatures? I mean, are there, he finds a lot of them around? or? Yeah. Interesting. I haven't seen too many. They must exist, though. Yeah? I'm saying they evolved, but not because they are useful for anything except the fact that they're possible. Like, it's not usual for a bird to be as flamboyant as a peacock, but there are a handful of cases where this happened, where there was enough extreme sexual selection to push something very crazy and not useful. And that you have to, we have to realize evolution that isn't just survival of the fittest, it's survival of the weird, the cool, the interesting, you know, the freakish. All kinds of things can get through. Sexual selection is like the mechanism that makes it possible, but it may not be the only mechanism that makes it possible. Because you have these freakish things like these cuttlefish that change colors and things. And, and uh, that example seems like a real mix of, you know, I think if you wind evolution back and start it going again, you're not going to get the same creatures we have now. It wasn't inevitable to get what we have. These are possibilities that made it through against all odds. You know, maybe everything we have is, you know, are, are freaks of nature. Human beings certainly are. We're totally crazy. We're not very adaptive. You know, we're, you think of all the kinds of animals that have lived on Earth. You know, we have very strange strategies for survival. Look, we have to build these buildings. We, we have to write books and do all this crazy stuff, you know. Yeah?
Oh, Richard Dawkins? Yeah. Well, Richard Dawkins is, is patently wrong about so many things. I mean, he, he, he thinks that he's a champion of science against faith or against religion. He thinks religion is just stupid. But actually, Dawkins just has an extremely religious attitude about science. He has such faith about science that it blinds him to really seeing what science can explain and what it can't explain. So he doesn't see a lot of what's going on in the world because he so, has such faith in his point of view. So he, 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 if he admitted that, then he would... Uh, you know, he would uh, understand better what he's doing. Like most of us has, have faith in science. We don't believe in science because we understand it or we've reasoned our way through it. We take science as our religion because we, we trust it somehow. We don't need to know how everything works. But I think um, what fascinates me is how you can't really blend these perspectives into one. You can't make art easily into science or science into art. But you should recognize how they've in influenced each other and how they're different. Like, I think really science and art have um, really different criteria for truth. And you, know, you say that maybe there's scientists who get angry at me. On the other side, there are like uh, new agey, kind of synthetic, holistic thinkers who get mad at me, who want to put everything together. Art and science must be one. Because like I said this recently at a talk, and people thought I was a traitor. Like, we thought you were on our, we thought you were on our side, but now you're saying science and art are different? I said, yeah, they're different, you know. Because the artwork can make, make one gesture, one statement. It can be beautiful and touch people and be meaningful. The scientist has to do the same thing and test it a thousand times to even have a chance of saying it might be true. You know, science can be easily falsified by something new. Art doesn't work that way. One successful, beautiful thing can be enough. And so they're, very, they're different, but they very much can relate to each other because science is the search for order, and art can help teach us what counts as being ordered, you know, and, and um, just as mathematics, fractal mathematics, finds a, set, a source of order in, in kind of what previously seemed chaotic, abstract art in the same way enables us to see as something beautiful, something previously seemed <coughs> chaotic and um, of no interest, you know, so the things really should be, you know, more art students should be here. And, uh, you know, I think they'd be here if their professor said, you get extra credit if you come, or I, I want to see your name on this sheet. That's what it comes down to, the names on the signing sheet. But, um, you know, I think, you know, you know, these connections are very important, and they should, they should be explored in more detail in many different ways, and, but not, not be made too easy, not be made too, too easily blurred together. And, uh, you know, m much more can be said about that. Yes. They do so many weird things, changing color on their body. They do, they do enough uh, weird things that my my friend Jaron Lanier, who invented the term virtual reality, said it was really invented by squid, by cuttlefish. They are the first avatars and virtual beings because they change, they communicate with each other by changing their shape and color, doing crazy things. Like, for example, uh, some of the things they do are adaptive in very strange ways, like a, um, a, uh, if, uh, if a male sees a male trying to mate with a female and he wants to get in there, he'll suddenly change himself into a female, so he looks like a female, to distract the other male and run in there and mate really quickly. And the first male doesn't even know what he saw. Like, was he seeing things? And then on the other hand, they will sometimes um, just put on this weird display as they're swimming along, like putting on lights and colors. You don't know why they're doing it. And, um, you know, it's a very strange phenomenon, not very well understood. But, you know, not surprisingly, scientists are out there trying to figure out, can we learn how this works so we can do it ourselves for, like, magic military camouflage suits that do all these things. And so cuttlefish are would be quite fun to study, and there, we don't know much about what's going on, but people are trying to figure it out. Yeah? Uh, parts of them are sometimes, yeah. I, I mean, one interesting thing about cuttlefish and art, I have to say, is uh, there are a lot of videos and photographs of um, cuttlefish, 
endlessly put together by scientists, a lot of them online. But there's at least some, one scientist or somebody thought that, no, you know, people really have to pay attention to what's going on. And, and, and I don't know who this person was who decided that, he, that we had to create a cuttlefish pattern atlas of about 1,200 pages, all black and white pencil drawings done by graduate students in Italy at the University of Florence. And it's this huge book of pencil drawings, all black and white, of these phenomena. And he says that you know, it's only by drawing that we can really understand the, this phenomenon. And despite all these colors, and to understand the patterns, they all have to be drawn by hand and published in this giant book. I, I, I took it out of the library. I was amazed that this thing exists. That it's really somebody is suggesting that science must combine observation with replication of, of patterning directly, rather than all this photography and video and magic color stuff. We've got time for one more question, and then the evil take away. Okay, somebody in a different part of the room back there. Uh, it's a good question. Absolutely. I mean, all throughout it, I, I, I think I learned, well, personally, as from all the music I've done with different animals, how much the animal world seems more accessible and meaningful if you imagine that many of the sounds of animals are music rather than language, rather than a language that we don't understand that you want to translate or decode. If it's music, nobody understands music anyway. We don't know why music is so emotionally meaningful to us, but it is. And the same thing could suddenly happen with these mysterious sounds from, from the world around. So that's one thing. All right. Thanks so much for inviting me.